In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we shall consider how Advent is reflected in the Mass. In every Mass, our Lord comes to us, and thus in every Mass, everything done before the consecration is in some way a preparation for his coming. Advent, as you know, is a season to help us prepare both for our Lord's coming at the end of time, as well as for the celebration of his first coming at Christmas. And so we can see both of these themes reflected in the order of Mass itself leading up to the consecration. Today we will simply consider that very first part of the Mass, Psalm 42. In this psalm, we find two themes to guide us in Advent, consolation and contrition, hope and repentance. The coming of Christ is looked forward to both as a liberator, whose advent we should rejoice in, and a judge, whose sentence we should piously fear. And should we not live long enough to be here for at his triumphant return, we can apply all of this to our death, but he comes for each of us individually. Psalm 42 begins, Eudicame, judge me. We ask first, to be distinguished from the wicked, that we may be delivered from the unjust and deceitful man. And so with our Lord, who will come at the end of time to free us from all things evil, when he will come to judge the living and the dead and the world by fire. Only in the second coming will Christ free us entirely from persecution, from disease, from the dangers of the enemy. And so we ought to look forward to this coming with longing and plead for him to come and set things right. But within this lies, or ought to lie, a certain trepidation as well. Eudicame, judge me. We are asking for Christ to return as judge, not simply the judge of the world, but our own judge. What if it is we who are unjust. What if it is we who are the deceitful man? Then we must follow the psalm and ask to be separated from him, purified of him. We turn our hearts to contrition. Advent, a penitential season, is a good time to take stock of our lives again, to look again at bad habits that may have crept in, snuck up on us in that long time since Lent, a good time to prepare our souls for Christ's advancing judgment. St. John the Baptist, our great guide during this season, proclaims that Christ will come with his winnowing fan to cleanse his floor and gather his wheat into the barn and to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Every time we appeal to Christ for judgment against the wicked, we should do so fearfully, We should take consolation that he will save the just from the wicked, but we should have contrition as well, and plead much more so that he will save us from ourselves. And we must be willing to give up whatever we must for him to do so, to let the chaff of our souls be burned off here and now, lest there be nothing left worth salvaging at the end. Every time we turn to God and plead, save me from this, Lord, save me from this sickness, from this person, from this affliction, we ought first to pray, save me from sin, save me from myself, and then do with me what you will. As we continue this psalm, we ask, why? Why has God seemed to cast us off? Why are we sorely oppressed by the wicked? Again, how lost is the world without Christ? How alone was Israel, even in the times of the kings and the prophets? How alone they were? And until Christ comes again, even while he is present with us always in the church and the sacraments, we too go sorrowfully oppressed. Again, we long for the consolation of the end. Again, We should reflect that the greatest enemy that afflicts us is ourselves. If you ever want to sound wise, when speaking kindly about someone, you can always say, he is his own worst enemy, because it is true for all of us. 
If we should never oppose God in anything, the devil would have no power over us at all, and sinful man would be no threat either. So what is the solution? What does the psalm say next? Send forth thy light and thy truth. Only these will bring us safely home. We pray that Christ will come like lightning, turning all night into day, shedding light upon all those dark corners where evil hides, that the wicked, who hate the light because their deeds are evil, have no more dark abode, no more escape, that their lies are discovered, their secret abuses made known to all. Surely, we can think of those men whose wicked deeds are coming more and more to light, who strive to cover them up, and thought that they had succeeded in this for years and years. But none shall escape the light of God, none shall escape his justice. And again, not even we ourselves. More so than ought we to pray for God to shine his light into our hearts and into our lives. Far more important for us to be free of the darkness inside our souls than that outside them. Have we started to slip into shadows? Have our examinations grown lax and seldom made? Have those little excesses grown larger as we looked some other direction? Those little discourtesies and resentments, have they festered as we ignored them? Salutary penance brings light into the soul, more time in prayer and fasting in silence. Send forth thy light and thy truth. We continue the psalm. Confitelor tibi, I will confess to you. Here, like the confessions of St. Augustine, we speak both of our own confession of faith as well as of our sins. And so again, we find our souls sad. Why does our soul disquiet us? Why does it disturb us? What is the solution for wickedness in the world and in ourselves? Spera in Adeo. Hope, hope not in man, certainly not in ourselves, but hope in God alone. If we do not approach Christmas or the consecration at Mass without the absolute conviction that there is no earthly power that can save us, no earthly solution to our problems, no secular state that can reform man, no spouse that that can complete us, no job that will fulfill us, no creature comfort that will satisfy us. If we do not have this conviction, we have no hope. Hope in anything but God is false hope, is sure to be dashed. We will be sorely disappointed when the great leader stumbles, when our families, our jobs, ourselves disappoint us at every turn. Your soul is cast down within you. Hope in God. Praise God. Yearn for God. Yearn for the coming of our Lord. For him to come to set all things right at the end of time. For him to come down upon the altar. For him to come into your soul and set things right there. Believe in yourself, says the world. Believe not in yourself, nor in any man, but in God alone. And so, this very first section of the Mass closes the way it began, with its thrice-repeated refrain, I will go unto the altar of God, to the God who gives joy to my youth. When lived properly, Advent makes us young again in Christ. There are those who grow old and tired in their souls, who grow comfortable in their sins, their vices, their bad habits, old enmities. They move slowly, reluctantly, hopelessly. So we must ask God to make us young again in our souls, young in Christ, to become those new wineskins awaiting the new wine. Christ came to an old world to give it a fresh start. He will come again to give perpetual youth to the saved, 
a new earth, a fresh world. And he is coming today, coming every day, to those aged by the world. He comes to the old you to give your soul its youth again. He comes in Holy Communion to refresh your soul for the journey. And so we ask, how has my soul grown old this year? But sins and attachments weigh it down, make it brittle and weary of doing what is good. If God were to wipe your slate clean, give you a fresh start, a young soul, what would that look like? What past sins would you leave behind, yours or those of others? With what refreshed fervor would you pray? Let us use the season of Advent wisely to examine our lives, to beseech our Lord, to make the way straight for his coming into the world about us, but most of all, into our souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.